Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have an interview with Diana Foe, a two-time Hugo-nominated editor with Tor.com Publishing, and she's going to help me understand the role of sensitivity readers and how to write a diverse cast of characters without completely screwing it up. It's a great interview. I found it really helpful, and I'm also pretty sure Diana is going to be contributing segments about fiction writing in the future, so we'll have that to look forward to. But first, today's episode is supported by an inspiring writing podcast called Writing Class Radio. Writing Class Radio airs true, personal stories. After each story, the hosts break down the stories and give concrete tips on how to make your own writing better. The hosts also interview top editors from major publishers on what it takes to get a story published. If you love stories and want to learn a little about how to write your own, check out Writing Class Radio wherever you listen. And now on to my interview with Diana Foe. Hi, so thank you for being here with me today. Hi, Mignon. It's a great pleasure to be here as well. I'm really excited to chat with you. Yeah, me too. So can you tell the um, listeners, can you say your name and then what you do at the publishing house? Okay. Uh, My name is Diana Foe. I'm an editor at Tor Books. I've been at Tor for about eight years working in editorial, but I've also been in publishing for 12 years working at other positions at other houses as well. Wonderful. I love Tor. Um, So many good books. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I like to think so myself, but that's a purely biased opinion. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I really love science fiction and fantasy, so I, I've known Tor a long time. Um, so we're here today because um, a few weeks ago I talked with Kat Brzezowski, who works for Swoon Reads and focuses on YA. And some things came up, like sensitivity readers and writing marginalized characters, and I wanted to know more about that. And she thought that you would be the person to help me. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm hoping we can sort of dig into some questions today that I've been struggling with and I imagine other writers struggle with, and also just some new ideas. So one of the first things, you know, she talked about the book publishing process and how now often they'll bring in a sensitivity reader. And I imagine that a lot of my listeners have never heard of such a thing. And um, to me, it's even new within the last probably five years that I've been hearing about it being sort of more involved in publishing. So can you just explain like what a sensitivity reader is and how that works? Sure thing. So um, you're right. The term sensitivity reader is a relative new concept in the publishing industry, but I think that writers themselves have used them for much, much longer. They just didn't use that specific term. Uh, Mm -hmm. I would like to think about a sensitivity reader as a cultural consultant. You know, and you heard of that term perhaps when working with other media properties for film and television, especially. Um, oftentimes you get consultants on various topics, whether it's, you know, the writer's room has a medical show and they just want some doctors at hand to make sure that all their medical knowledge is accurate. Um, and so, a studio reader works pretty much the same way. They are a person with expert knowledge uh, in a certain culture or a community, specifically because they have lived experience uh, in it. They're part of the community, they identify with them, and they bring that knowledge to uh, help consult a writer who is writing outside of their experience, you know, involving aspects of that community. And um, I definitely also want to point out that sensitivity readers, as I mentioned before, have been around for a very long time. But I think the current conversation uh, has now coined this term specifically because there is more and more discussion about how to, uh, one, portray different communities outside of the writer's own uh, in a respectful and accurate way. But also the larger conversation about what does it mean to have representation in the book industry and having sensitivity readers involved in the editorial process is just one of the many ways that we can help uh, ensure accurate and authentic stories are being told and the right people are being uh, fairly acknowledged in participating in that process. 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, I can imagine, you're right. I think authors have been doing it themselves and not even really thinking about it that way. Because if I were writing about a, a character who uses a Southern dialect or a Caribbean dialect, I definitely might go to someone who, you know, lives in the South or lives in the Caribbean and say, like, did I get this even close to right? <laughs> and can you help me if I didn't? Um, so what, do, do you have any idea, like, sort of what, brought the process more into publishing as part of the formal process is something that, as opposed to something that, you know, writers were kind of doing scattershot by themselves? I think in general, there's more of an awareness in the publishing industry as well as in the writers' communities about what does it mean to have, you know, fair, respectful, and accurate representation. And, um, you know, because I know historically uh, there is something that has to be acknowledged when it comes to, quote, unquote, writing the other. And that is basically how oftentimes this conversation, well, you know, while uh, it's, it comes up in a, from a place of respect and good intentions, the execution isn't always, you know, as strong. It doesn't really follow through. Uh, for example, um, historically, you know, we have published, you know, people that identify as part of, like, the U.S. majority in several aspects, whether it's because they're most identified as male or white or straight um, or cisgender or Christian. All these aspects um, have created a certain um, uh, level of power dynamics about who gets published in the first place. And oftentimes, when people try to write outside of these, you know, this larger, you know, cultural dynamic that is the assumption of that is the reader, that is the writer, then, you know, if they write about other communities or people different from themselves, um, you know, statistically, they would get published more often even though they don't identify as part of the community they're writing about. And that mm -hmm. has resulted in some damaging consequences. Uh, one of the damaging consequences is that they would get it incorrect. They would portray it insensitively. They would involve, you know, um, damaging stereotypes that they don't even know they were doing because they're not part of the community. They didn't have that knowledge ba or background. They thought, oh, if I did enough research, I would know I would be able to have that knowledge and incorporate into my writing in a respectful way. But if you're not part of a, a community that you're writing about, there's always things that you that you miss. There's always things that, you know, you might not even know the questions were questions to ask when writing about it, which results, you know, in those damaging, you know, representations. Um, uh, another aspect is also, uh, it's another question that has been come coming up in the discussion is not only how, how do you participate in fair representation, but also how do you acknowledge the power dynamics of, you know, statistically, if you are a writer of a certain background, you will be more likely to be published than a writer from that community you're writing about. Um, that is just historically, you know, by the numbers, the case that is still the case today. Uh, and I think that working with sensitivity uh, readers in projects like this is just one of the many ways a writer can try to balance out that, you know, that power dynamic more. So, you know, people are being fairly acknowledged and compensated for the work that they're doing, but also reestablishing certain relationships that perhaps have never existed before or perhaps have, you know, had a rocky, you know, history because of, you know, the treatment of these communities in order to have writers and creatives from those backgrounds also get the connections they need for themselves to be published and their voices heard as well. This is how as I like to think about the use of sensitivity readers as a two-pronged um, technique. It's both, quote-unquote, a Band-Aid solution. It can seem a little bit superficial just to ask an outsider to cover, you know, a community um, but then have that community evolved in a one-time event, but also hopefully in a long-term advantage, you know, build those connections to incorporate people who are writers, who are experts from marginalized communities into the publishing process to help boost their own creatives and voices as well. So that is how ideally I would like to see 
sensitivity readers being used. Yeah, that sounds great. And I definitely want to get to writing characters, but I, I want to finish up a few more questions about sensitivity readers because it sounds like such an interesting job, too. And so I'm wondering— um, you know, one, how you find people, how, how you find the people to do this. And and then two, sort of at what point does it happen in the process? You know, I'm just, is it before the copy edit? Is it during the developmental stage? Like when when do you bring someone in? Um, you know, first of all, for Green of Salt, this is purely, you know, my, you know, opinion and technique. And I know different houses and different editors have certain standards and even you know, in the conversation between authors and agents before the manuscripts even shopped around, the question of sensitivity readers comes up. So uh, basically, there are a lot of different points where a sensitivity reader can come into the creative process. Uh, but I think what's most important is for a writer, even before starting a project, is acknowledging where their gaps of knowledge lie. And if they want to tell a story in the best way that they possibly could know that they will eventually have to enlist, you know, a sensitive reader to be part of the creative process. And what does that mean? Um, I've definitely worked with uh, authors and agents who've told me up front that the author did, a t you know, a ton of legwork themselves and hired sensitive readers before they even shopped the manuscript around because they felt it was their ethical responsibility to do so, which is fabulous. You know, I definitely encourage that. Um, you know, I myself have also hired sensitivity readers after I acquired a manuscript um, and after the uh, developmental process is finished so that I can, you know, if I myself am acknowledging certain gaps uh, in my editorial expertise, and I would like another sensitivity reader to pitch in, that's when I would involve them in the process. Um, I know other houses do it differently. I know other editors do it differently. Uh, but that's particularly where I come in. And is it just sort of word of mouth, how you find people that, that can do this work for you? Um, sometimes it's word of mouth. Uh, I know one of the difficulties I get you know, all the time when people are looking to find these activity readers is where, where can I find them? Because basically, you know, there are services that offer a centralized database of readers. There was one uh, writing in the margins that had, you know, shut down uh, because the person who started it just didn't want to maintain it um, and, were, and was getting a lot of um, challenges that they didn't expect when they opened up the database. Um, which is also perfectly fine and legitimate. For me, when I'm looking at sensitivity readers, first of all, it's a conversation with the author and, you know, and being, you know, very upfront and honest and being like, all right, this is where, you know, I have a knowledge gap, you have a knowledge gap. I think we need to get a consultant on this project to fulfill those gaps. Um, you know, I would always make sure that the author is on the page before I even, you know, hire one myself to know that this is part of the process. This is how I do things um, and, and just to help set expectations. And then depending on what kind of reader um, I'm looking for, I would go to different places. Um, I, I've developed my own personal network of people that I go to for certain areas of knowledge, because, especially because since I edit science fiction fantasy, I want to also make sure that sensitivity reader that I work with has a knowledge of science fiction fantasy so they know how certain writing, um, you know, uh, tools are used. So they have understanding of certain tropes for genres uh, because that, you know, also help, you know, with the feedback that they give. Um, yeah. You know? And uh, and I also obviously look for expertise, um, not only because they're a community member, you know, I wouldn't just ask, you know, anyone's because, oh, you're part of X community. Obviously, you must be like the ultimate expert. And I should only ask you <laughs> to be my sensitivity <laughs> reader. Um, you know, so I definitely want to find people who want to do it, who want to actively do it, uh, because it's also an unfair expectation to just make assumptions that because you identify as something that, of course, you want to do a sensitivity reader read for, for a project. Um, so I would, you know, look for people who advertise that they offer those services. Um, if it's something that requires a certain level of historical background expertise, um, I would go to community centers or organizations that, like, 
you know, uh, you know, work with, you know, community outreach. Um, I would go to universities and graduate student programs, actually, because oftentimes, you know, they would have very specific knowledge bases on something, you know, whether it has to do with, you know, uh, any sort of racial or ethnic, you know, oriented studies programs or historical programs, um, you know, and they can get very specific in ways that I wouldn't even anticipate. So I would definitely go to like, you know, university um, grad student programs, uh, you know, and reach out to professors in case there's any interested students uh, that would have that knowledge base. Um, and I would also just do things like do outreach on my social media platforms just because I'm already connected with a lot of organizations through that that would boost um, on their end as well. So it can be a wide range of ways that you can find sensitivity readers. I think the most important part is to really think about what kind of expertise you're looking for, uh, first of all. Uh, second of all, knowing that going into the search that you have to have more than one sensitivity reader uh, for a project. Yeah, and that's what I was just thinking. Like, it's a lot to ask of just one person, like, like right. to ask one person to represent an entire community. Like that's not, re- I mean, it's better than nothing and they're going to catch you if you do something really stupid, but it also seems like, like, it, I mean, it's, and you, at some point you can't have 10 sensitivity readers, but it's a lot to ask of one person. Uh, right. It's a lot to ask of one person. Um, it's also, you know, for me, one of the um, concerns that I personally have when people use sensitivity readers is the idea that the author will suddenly use them as a stamp of approval as opposed to take their uh, critical editorial feedback as what it is. Critical editorial feedback um, with both its, you know, benefits and drawbacks, you know, including, you know, the, you know, the understanding that one person can't represent the whole of a community in all of its nuances, and that the project itself is still the author's responsibility. Um, if the author uses a sens- sensitivity readers for their project and still gets critique from that community, they can't, you know, say that. Oh, but why are you blaming me? I use sensitivity readers. Um, I think having that understanding of what sensitivity readers do. Um, kind of avoids the personal artistic responsibility that the author has no matter what they write for the projects that they write, period. And like with all stories, you know, it's a creative work from the author's, you know, ahead to the page. And in order to effectively engage in writing across cultures, I think authors just in general should have an understanding about their ethical responsibilities in making art. And what does that mean? And being able to use sensitivity readers in a way that treats them respectfully um, and also keeps in mind the author's own responsibilities towards the work is part of that. Great. Yeah, this is so helpful. So I want I want to take a quick break for a sponsor. And when we come back, I want to talk more about writing uh, marginalized characters or characters who aren't like you. So we'll be right back. Today's episode is supported by Ernest. If student loans are getting in the way of your life, refinance with Earnest. Earnest can help you pick a monthly payment for your student loans to help you breathe easier. And rates are low right now, so whether you've refinanced before or you're still paying the same rate as when you graduated, most people can save by refinancing now. And Earnest makes it easy to save. Just answer a few questions online and you'll get a personalized rate estimate without affecting your credit score. If you qualify, Ernest offers customizable loan terms and no fees. You can even combine private and federal loans into one single monthly payment with one low rate. Start saving today. My listeners can get a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at earnest.com slash grammar. That's a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at earnest, E-A-R-N-E-S-T dot com slash grammar. Go to earnest.com slash grammar today. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, we're back. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking... And I should stipulate, I don't write fiction, but I think about writing fiction a lot. I've dabbled, but I've never, you know, even finished a manuscript. But I think about it a lot. And I go to conferences where people talk about it. And so I imagine myself writing. And 
when I think about like, like sometimes I struggle with the idea of just writing a man, right? Because I'm not a man. And then, and then I think as a, you know, white middle-class, you know, middle-aged woman, how can I not only write a man, but write like maybe a, a gay Asian teenage boy, (laughs) you know? And then I, I start getting overwhelmed and thinking, am I even like, should I even try? <laughs> right? But I love books that have diverse cast of characters. Um, you know, they're more like the real world and they're more interesting. And, and if I wrote a book, I would want to include a, a whole bunch of different characters like that. But then I just, I think about it and I get all stressed. And so I was wondering, and, and I know Kat said that, that publishers are actively looking for books with characters like this. So um, what advice do you have for writers like me who, are, you know, should, should we not even try, like, if we're not comfortable with it? Or is there a way to get more comfortable with it? Like, like what should I do in my imaginary writing life? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, you know, I definitely have encountered a lot of writers of all backgrounds who share the same concerns that you have, uh, because there's a couple of things that I want to, um, clarify when it comes to, um, quote unquote, writing the other that I think, uh, people get stumped about. Um, you know, first of all, it's, you know, you, unless, unless the writer is writing a biography, an autobiography or a memoir, then any form of writing that they're doing is writing the other. <laughs> yeah, true, true. You know, <laughs> and, and, as you said, like, sometimes you struggle with, like, how to write a man. It's because, for you, writing a man is writing the other. And I think that people tend to frame that term uh, as coming from a white perspective um, and making the assumption that writing the other is automatically meaning it is a person from the majority writing about a marginalized identity. And writing the other can range from, for example, you know, if I write about white people, I'll be writing about the other from my perspective, too. Um, There's, of course, a difference in power dynamics. And that's the key here, uh, is that a a lot of marginalized communities know what, how the majority thinks, specifically because they have to have navigated their entire lives knowing, you know, they are, you know, part of a minority group being treated as such. What does that mean in order to adapt and survive and thrive? You know, oftentimes you'd have to learn the language of the people in power. And that is what, you know, people you know, imply by the term writing the other if you are a marginalized person writing about, um, you know, a, you know, someone or a group that is part of the majority, that has part of the dominant culture. Um, and that is the big difference, I think, between writing the other from a marginalized perspective and, you know, someone from the dominant culture writing about marginalized communities. It's one thing. Um, no, and that leads to another thing I want to clarify is that, you know, the I don't tend to use writing the other as a term, even though I know it's super common, specifically because it doesn't acknowledge that power dynamic, the different power dynamics that come from when you are a writer writing from a certain set of experiences that you know is your own personal baseline and how to reach out across to another community that has a different set of baselines and norms and understandings, all that stuff. That's why I tend to use writing across difference uh, because I think it is a more accurate uh, description of what a writer is doing. And I also think it acknowledges that to write this way is a form of cross-cultural communication that is a two-way street. The writer isn't just going out um, and taking stuff from a community, but it is a community gracious and generous enough to give back to the writer and the writer establishing a certain sense of ethical expectations because they are, you know, given um, these gifts that they didn't have to have or they didn't have to ask for. Um, And so what does that mean when you have, you know, a cross-cultural exchange? How do you keep that, you know, within uh, certain bounds and understandings? So those are big two things I wanted to clarify. And so when it comes to writing um, across difference, you know, 
first of all, like, it's totally possible, <laughs> you know, with the <laughs> understandings of, like, points one and two I just said. Um, and also, this is the big secret that I think people, you know, might be surprised to think about, but right across difference is a craft skill. It is not something anyone is born with. It is not something that people magically have because of who they are. It doesn't dictate that because you're part of a certain community, you are the expert in writing it or portraying it in an accurate, respectful way. Um, and it also means if right and cross difference is a craft skill, people can develop it. It is possible to do so. It's just that a lot of people do it very badly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't recall that I've ever seen, uh, are, are there good books you recommend or um, webinars or workshops or something? I don't know that I've ever seen anything along those lines, but I also, I don't think I've looked really hard either. Um, you know, the thing, the resource I recommend the most is literally called Writing the Other. <laughs> it is a uh, a book written by Nisi Shaw and Cynthia Ward uh, that is a very... Um, great starting guide of what it means. It explains, you know, a lot of the concepts I just related to you, plus much more. Um, and it's also connected to a series of, you know, online classes and webinars, you know, you know that people can sign up for to uh, learn specific knowledge uh, bases from people of marginalized communities. So it's literally writingtheother.com. And, <laughs> you know, you can go there, you can sign up for a webinar. They're taught by experts in various marginalized communities. Um, they also other offer a lot of additional resources to reach out and explore certain aspects. Um, uh, you know, that's basically my, my number one resource I always recommend. But also to keep in mind, you know, the the use of sensitivity readers, having a, you know, proper and respectful relationship with them, um, also reaching out to uh, community organizations and getting them involved too as part of the sensitivity reading process uh, on top of doing your own research. Um, you know, all that, you know, just forms the the foundation, I think, to help give writers a good start of what they're looking for. That's great. Well, one of the things you said earlier resonated with me. You said, you know, people aren't even sure what questions to ask sometimes, and I definitely feel that way. So is there something I haven't asked you that, that you feel is important to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Hmm. Well, one of the, you know, concerns I think a lot of people from marginalized communities have at this point in the sensitivity of conversation is whether because you have writers from the dominant culture writing about marginalized communities, uh, whether the marginalized communities are still um, at the expense when it comes to access to publishing. Yeah, and I worry about I, that. Right. And so I think it's still really important that, of course, when you write across difference, you do it uh, in a way that is ethically, you know, beneficial to yourself and to the people that you're working with. Um, it also has to be, you know, done with acknowledgement of uh, the writer's, you know, place in society that gives them that advantage to do that, uh, whether it's because you know, the writer is white or because they have financial resources or because they have time to work on a book uh, right. in a way that, you know, the person that is your sensitive reader can't because they're in a different financial situation or because they have different family obligations or cultural obligations that have to take priority, you know? Um, so, so I think that we have to always remember in line with this sensitivity reader conversation, we still have to look at ways where we can boost marginalized voices and perspectives that come from their community. And the most effective relationships I have seen authors do, uh, usually, you know, sometimes they stem from the readers that they work with. Sometimes they stem just for being in constant contact with the community that they're writing, you know, about. Um, mm -hmm is to signal boost their resources, their voices. I've had authors invite 
you know, authors from that community to guest blog. I've asked, you know, I've seen them being asked to do, to share um, author events with them. Um, I've seen, you know, critique groups form where like people exchange like manuscripts, you know, with each other. They've, you know, now they're equals as writers. So they're helping each other write and publish stories as well. Um, so I just want to make sure that when, when a writer decides to write across difference, they know it's not just a one-time thing. They know it's not a one-shot. They, it is establishing a relationship, you know, very much possibly a fruitful relationship, a very productive one, but that's what it is. It's a relationship, and it should not be taken advantage of um, solely to benefit the writer. Yeah, and those are those are great practical ideas of what you can do too. I love that. Um, thank you. This has been so helpful. You know, I've asked questions like this at conferences sometimes, and I get you know the one minute answer, and I never felt like I really understood. And I feel like being able to spend some time with you today, I have such a better understanding of how to think about this. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes, and I'm really glad that you could have me on the show. Yeah. And so if people want to find you, um, where are you online or or do you want to be found? What's the best way? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yes. So I am on Twitter and my Twitter handle is writer syndrome, one word. And I'm also available on Instagram under diana.m.fo. And that's P-H-O. Yep. Correct. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much again. Have a great day. Great. You too. Take care.